Hello, everyone. Welcome again. We're on our 23rd uh, Mass Timber March Madness episode. Uh, we have John Roebuck, Home Solutions, uh, giving us a very international perspective. So thank you, John. Please take it away. Yeah, good morning, everyone. So um, yeah, hi from uh, New Zealand. So uh, I guess for most of you, I'm talking to you from tomorrow. But um, I can assure you, uh, it doesn't look much different so far. Um, so uh, thanks to Greg for um, hosting this set of a series of seminars. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed watching them so far, uh, and particularly the the diversity of speakers and different subjects um, that we've seen. But what I have noticed is there's been uh, a number of common themes that have been recurring. And I think you'll probably see some of those popping up in the slides that I'm going to present today as well. So um, my um, uh, I'm, I got to know Greg a, earlier last year when we had a collaboration of a kind of design for manufacture exercise between um, my company Home Solutions and Cut My Timber. I'll, um, I'll talk a bit more about that in detail later on. Um, but I'm very, I'm conscious of Greg's advice that uh, this seminar is not a sales pitch. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about who I am and what we do, but to give some context about some of the observations that we've got about the industry and some of the directions that we might take going forward. So this is me. Um, I'm John Roebuck. I am a mechanical engineer by training. Um, I'm a relative newcomer to the construction sector. So most of my career has been spent actually in the automotive industry uh, with, a, with a little bit of time in uh, aerospace and, and motorsport and marine sectors as well. Um, but it's predominantly been in this kind of medium size engineering um, with a focus on high volume production and efficiency. So that's quite a different world from where I find myself working now. But what I find interesting is seeing the way that the, um, the construction industry as a whole and mass timber is looking for ways to adopt maybe some of the ideas and the principles from uh, industries like this and translate them into a very different environment. So I work for uh, Home Solutions, which is part of the Homes group of companies. Now, I'm sure some of you are going to be familiar with um, Homes Fire and Home Structures from the projects they've worked on in the USA, uh, particularly uh, on the West Coast. So, uh, and Home Structures, uh, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with Eric McDonnell, who we are lucky to count as one of our principals from the work that he's done for us and for KPFF. Um, so home structures are our, and homes consulting are our structural engineering arms in the US and New Zealand and Europe respectively. Homes Fire are our fire engineers globally. Where we fit into this at Home Solutions, we're kind of the uh, innovation lab for the rest of the group. We do the, uh, the research and development and the product development. Sometimes that's, uh, in response to a demand from projects that these um, companies are working on. In other cases, it's completely independent projects. Um, and it's not just in the construction sector, there's a whole variety of things we work on, which I'll, um, I'll show you on a, in a couple of slides time. So the group as a whole has worked on a number of mass timber buildings. Here's a selection of a few that uh, we've worked on in the US, um, predominantly in California and Oregon, because that's where that, uh, our two primary centers for home structures are, are based. Um, but a common theme that runs through the majority of these buildings is they've needed some kind of um, alternative means and method request. Um, because there's, for either the structural or the fire solution, there's been some element of performance-based engineering. So some of these 
uh, a couple of these buildings have been designed uh, under the Tallwood provisions of IBC 2012, uh, 2021 rather. So from a fire engineering perspective, that's um, quite a step up in its demands. Uh, and in some cases, a performance-based approach has been the, uh, the only way to get to a solution for that. So I guess what I'm trying to say is we're, that's already effectively becoming the norm for us, that um, in order to achieve the types of buildings that we're looking for, it's already normal for us to have to step outside prescriptive code solutions. Um, and I'll, I'll return back to that theme uh, a little bit later on. So what we do at Home Solutions, um, so we're um, basically everything we do, you could sum up as evidence-based product development. Uh, and we work in a, in a whole number of different sectors, not just in construction. Um, you can see uh, some of the images we show here. We work in adventure recreation on um, zip lines and uh, zip uh, zip rides and adventure rides and so on. Um, in roadside safety with crash barriers um, uh, and uh, height safety equipment for working at heights. All kinds of different areas. Um, but the uh, fundamentally. Uh, Everything is based around our laboratory. So you can see that in the, in the background of my, um, uh, of my presentation here. So this is one half of our lab. So we, we have a, a large space which has got um, structural testing machines. It's got a fire furnace. It's got a machine shop, a CNC area, fabrication, so on. Pretty much everything you need to build and test prototype specimens. And that's very, integral to how we see product development. Um, we do have a broader R&D capability, so we um, we definitely embrace like the, the desktop development tools like uh, analysis and so on, uh, FEA. But at some point, we feel that a product development process has to make that transition from the virtual world into the real world. And that the earlier you can do that in the product development cycle, the earlier you can get your hands dirty and actually play with these products and see how they're working, the, the more benefit you're going to realize from that. So the types of, types of clients that we work with um, in the construction sector, we like to work with clients who are kind of aligned with our way of thinking um, and have an innovative approach to what they do. So these are some of the guys that we've been working with uh, in recent years. So that's probably uh, enough background about us and what we do. Let's talk a little bit more about mass timber technology. So we've seen a bit of a shift in the in the kind of things that we do in the last couple of years. Traditionally, we've done a lot of component testing and development, um, often to prescriptive standards, um, and usually in isolation from the rest of the system or building. What we've seen in the last couple of years is there's a lot of energy going into digital systems. So that's part of the systemization of the industry that's going to ho hopefully yield these benefits in um, efficiency because we're modularizing the um, construction system. Um, it should be a, it should enable us to transition to more of a kind of a, a, a product based um, volume type manufacture situation to realize some of these um, efficiency gains and, and make mass timber construction as competitive as it can be. Uh, now, what we see is a lot of effort going into the creation of these systems, particularly from a software perspective. Um, What's equally important is the physical products that are 
the makeup of these systems. So they need to have uh, effectively a catalogue of parts, a kit of parts to, to create these buildings from. And when we so embarked on, on this type of work um, within the context of systems, I think we, uh, we had an expectation the majority of those physical products would simply be uh, selected from uh, existing suppliers, existing products combined in the most useful and the most efficient, efficient way to give the performance required for the building. Um, as we've got deeper into these sorts of exercises, what we're starting to realize is that when you start to have that system level view, a lot of the products that are currently available are not really delivering to the maximum potential. And in, in a lot of the cases, that's when you have kind of uh, stacked requirements. So uh, you can have a, a fire requirement, say IBC 2021 with, with requirements for charring layer and so on, um, combined with a seismic uh, requirement because you're building on the West Coast, combined with a target for uh, efficient assembly um, and maybe maximizing off-site uh, assembly versus on-site construction. Once you start stacking all of those requirements, we're finding fewer and fewer products that actually tick all of those boxes and that product development is actually a key part of getting these digital systems to where they need to be. So that sort of led me to what I think is the key message uh, for this presentation, which is we, as an industry, we need to be prepared to develop unconventional products. So what I mean by that, let's take a look at what I mean by a conventional product. Um, so that would be a design which is using existing off-shelf components, um, the solutions are all code-based, prescriptive, uh, and typically that design takes place, let's say in silos. So uh, very separate, the design of a, a detail, let's say, uh, happens very independently from any study of design for manufacture or um, design for assembly or, or, or cycle time on site, that sort of thing. Uh, now I'm showing a picture here, which is, um, it, it's, a, it's a public domain detail from a building here in New Zealand. I'm not picking on anything in particular. It's a perfectly valid structural solution. It's a code compliant uh, connection for a number of components, um, but it's very labor intensive. It's a, it's a triple steel knife plate with a hundred odd dowels, I think. It's, it's the kind of thing that, um, it's a typical outcome of conventional design. And often, not in all cases, but the outcomes from that kind of approach are a complex assembly, um, inefficient, inefficiency, I guess you can measure in uh, lots more ways than just um, performance and component cost. There's a lot of other efficiencies that are maybe less tangible. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how maybe we've got ways to, to measure those later. Um, particularly for IBC 2021 with the, um, the steel temperature requirements, we see a lot of existing solutions that are just non-solutions for that. Um, and we also see very few um, solutions which target um, low damage for uh, seismic. So that's something that's quite, uh, it's, it's quite, a, it has high visibility here in Christchurch because we had our own significant earthquake here about uh, 10 years ago. Um, and we've recently, um, We've, we've had a very first-hand experience of the cost of rebuild and the cost of insurance and so on. Um, and it's, it's something that's pretty high on the agenda here in New Zealand, but 
probably something I see less so overseas. Um, but if the economic model for insurance adjusts so that that becomes a, a key driver, I could see that being a, a key requirement of some of these kinds of products and details that form part of these systems. So I th one thing I guess I need to make clear is what I see as the difference between a product and a detail. So um, here's a detail. It's actually, a, a, I think it's quite an elegant detail. It's um, designed by uh, our own Eric McDonnell. It's from the, the framework building in Portland. Um, it's designed, it is actually one of the few details that is designed for low seismic damage. It's got a very neat little uh, uh, setup here for the tie bracket, which, uh, which absorbs um, rotation of a beam to a column. Um, but it's a one-off de detail at this, uh, at this stage. So it's been fully tested to prove its performance. But effectively, if we did this for every building, that's like reinventing the wheel um, and generating one-off data each time. And that gets very expensive. And if, if that's your only way to be able to step outside of code and use performance-based engineering, that doesn't feel like a sustainable um, way to create a system. What we feel is we have to take these kinds of details into the product space. So the, the kinds of elements that are being used in these sorts of details have to be um, produced by a manufacturer who has uh, a process, uh, a quality approved process and a quality assurance, um, so that that can then have uh, a product approval. And that effectively means you can copy and paste these kinds of products. Um, I mean, I've shown a connection detail here, but the same thing equally applies to fire protection details or flooring systems or, or, or whatever, but something that you can copy and paste from building to building and reuse the data. Um, and that way you minimize your compliance costs per building. And really in, well, in the US, the, um, the, the way to do that and to minimize this risk of, um, you know, the, the, the it's, there's, there's a lack of certainty around how uh, an authority having jurisdiction is going to treat a detail like this. You, um, the engineer on record always has the, um, the ability to ask for more or additional test data or whatever to, to be satisfied. If we're gonna take this product approach, you need to be going into those situations with a level of approval that uh, is unlikely to be challenged. And in the US, that's basically uh, an ICC evaluation report. In Europe, it's uh, European type approval. So we're aware that there's a very small number of these that have been successfully issued in the mass timber space, um, predominantly for uh, things like structural fasteners, but it is starting to happen. Uh, and we, we've had some discussions with ICC NTA about the, um, the ability to take things more like this through the same process. And it certainly seems to be possible. Um, and there is a pathway. It's, uh, it's just important to engage with these bodies early in the process of the development of a product to make sure that the kind of evidence that you're producing is aligned with the, the requirements of the, the acceptance criteria, for example. So if we're gonna develop the right products to serve these digital systems, the key, I believe, is starting with requirements, not starting with the solutions. And that's a little bit of a mindset shift because when you come from a traditional code designing um, background typically the code issues you the solution and then it's up to you to figure out um, how you make that work for you if you're going to design a 
step outside of that and design your own product. It's about defining what the requirements are. Uh, and the requirements come from a number of sources. I mean, you've got your legislation for sure. You've got your agencies who need the evidence for product approval. But then you've also got your own targets, um, the requirements of real world users, like the construction teams, for example, the, uh, the owners, the occupiers, the manufacturers, uh, the, com the component suppliers and so on. Um, and potentially efficiency targets for construction of the building. So um, days per floor, for example, or minutes of crane hook time for a particular component, that kind of thing. And the key thing is during the development process to make sure that the, the products that are, and, and the systems that are being developed are measured against these requirements at every step of the way. One of the key things to achieving those uh, efficiencies is to engage the experts along the way. Um, so this is where our, our first involvement with um, Greg came about. So we, uh, we wanted to develop a set of rules for features that you could machine into timber components based on the available uh, component, uh, the available um, catalog of tooling for a typical CNC machine. So we did an exercise together to look at what the, the capacities and capabilities were of uh, a Hundega K2i, for example, as a, as a typical industry-wide um, machine. Look at which of the uh, add-on tool libraries were, um, were, were common. Uh, and from that, we could define what types of features were uh, economical to design in. And it was really interesting for us what a subtle difference there was between uh, something that was uh, fast and easy to manufacture and something that presented considerable challenges, not something that would be obvious to the majority of designers. Um, so that was, a, that was a really useful exercise and a good example of the kind of services that someone like Cut My Timber can offer as a, a you know, even on a consultancy basis, not necessarily uh, for a particular product. Um, and we've also had, uh, we've had a good uh, experience working with um, other, other bodies. So Scion are the government research institute for timber here in New Zealand. And the advantage of working, I, I guess they're a little bit like uh, like woodworks in a way, or they're, they're an industry representative body. The advantage of working with uh, an outfit like that is they have uh, a wide range of collective experience. Uh, and one thing that we've noticed is it's, it's very easy to be um, driven by your own personal experiences or the experiences of your own company, but they can be quite different. If you focused on particular solutions for a long time, perhaps you're missing some of the uh, other opportunities that are out there from thinking about something from a different angle or using a different method. Um, and uh, another company, Techlam here in New Zealand, who are a, a laminated timber supplier, they've been particularly useful to us in exploring opportunities for um, innovative ways of, of laminating up timber um, components. So engaging with suppliers is definitely something that I would, uh, I would consider a key activity up front in any sort of product development. Um, this is a chart which I think has actually cropped up a couple of times already during these uh, presentations, but it's something that we, we see over and over again, the cost of change. Um, by far the most efficient time to be making changes is as early as possible in the product uh, design and development cycle. And it sounds like a really obvious thing to say. And I think especially when you've come from other industries, uh, like other high volume manufacturing industries, it's, it's just taken as a given. But I think there's still a little bit of a conflict here with where traditionally the construction industry has been where any sort of um, 
confirmation testing is seen as a, a final activity which happens at the end of the design phase and you have to go into that with uh, an expectation of minimum risk that um, failing that test is uh, almost unacceptable which means you have to carry a level of conservatism into that test that potentially holds back discovering new opportunities. So in order to explore that, I think that's where you need to find a, a, a partner and, or a facility that has the ability to do testing in two different gears, like to do it at a, a learning level and to do it at a proving level. Um, and this learning level is, it's complementary to your desktop design, to your CAD design and your, your analysis and so on, but it's definitely a shortcut to, to the answers. And this is where you can do your exploring of, of new ideas, finding out proof of concepts and not being afraid to fail because you're, you're not invested at that point. It's so early in the design cycle, you can afford to try things and you can afford to get it wrong a couple of times. But you're almost certainly going to learn something um, and you can be nimble you can try you can do you can do quick iterations of things until you find the optimum it's that you don't just get one shot at your solution and that's it um, so this is the time to investigate unconventional solutions and establish that you can you can achieve the performance for sure later on in the uh, product development cycle, you need to change gears to um, a much more thorough way of testing for proving. And this is where you provide your evidence for product approval. So at this point, the testing has to be compliant. It's got to be recognized by um, an accredited authority. And one of the key things that we've found is that you need to engage early with um, an agency like, for example, ICC NTA, who can provide advice on what tests you should be carrying out in order to answer the requirements of an ICC acceptance criteria. And that way your uh, expectations are aligned from the start. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about um, some of the efficiencies that are may be less tangible. So we call these assembly metrics. Um, and we would see that evidence-based development is not just for your basic safety performance metrics. So we know that you can test for capacity, seismic compatibility, fire rating, that sort of thing. What we increasingly find ourselves doing is testing these softer kind of parameters, these assembly metrics. So uh, looking at the effects of tolerancing, um, speed of installation, um, efficiencies uh, in the work site, so crane hook times, that sort of thing, and, and the, uh, the implications for operators. So fatigue of using different kinds of tools in different situations and so on. Um, and there's no reason why these can't be as significant drivers for product development as these traditional kind of harder performance metrics. So where do we where do we see the biggest bang for buck in uh, in this product development um, direction? So in the context of mass timber systems, connections seem to be uh, one of the biggest opportunities. They are often the bottleneck for capacity limit for a particular uh, geometry. We've seen situations where the connection design, particularly when it combines with seismic or fire requirements, actually ends up defining the um, primary element sizing, um, which means they're effectively the, 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 the limiting um, bottleneck for the system. Um, there's also, from what we can see, a pretty limited number of um, solutions out there that have seismic or fire ratings, particularly for the US. So um, definitely opportunities there for, for developing products. 
um, for for fire solutions. Uh, I, I mentioned it before, we see IBC 2021 as a huge challenge. Um, the, to be a bit more specific about that, the steel temperature requirements are effectively lower than the activation temperature of most intumescent protections. So that means that uh, the traditional sort of get out of jail methods of um, coating steel components if they're exposed in intumescence are potentially not going to work. So some more novel and innovative ways of addressing that are likely to be required um, for, for buildings built under those codes. Um, composite structures. So I think there's definitely space for us to be um, more open-minded about what constitutes a mass timber building. Um, using hybrid structures of various materials or even using various timber species within a, a single element, that sort of thing. Um, definitely uh, opportunity for development there. And, and also um, modification of the of the material so that's uh, i mean that 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 could encompass a whole range of things um so there's uh, in terms of durability we see uh these opportunities for bio-based um moderate treatments uh so you can effectively use the same or similar components uh indoors and outdoors um reinforcement uh structural reinforcement so a lot of the keys to unlocking um, performance, particularly performance of connections, seems to be reinforcement um, perpendicular to grain. So typically that's being done with um, uh, screws at the minute, but that may not be the only or the most efficient way to do it. So we could definitely see opportunities for improving perpendicular to grain properties by, by other means. Um, so I think there's a lot of directions we could be pushing these products within the systems to try and achieve the best efficiencies um, that we can. So really, yeah, that brings me back to my sort of key message, which was that I think we need to be prepared to develop unconventional products, um, unconventional products that have some adventurous element to their design. They are performance-based engineering, so they're evidence-based and they're integrated. So we integrate our approach to fire and seismic and, and structural design for a single product. And that I see is the, the key to unlocking the gains for these, these modular systems. So that was, that was pretty much my, my message for today. Um, thanks very much for, for listening. Um, I'm more than happy to answer some questions if you've got some. I'll um, hand back to you, Greg. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I, I have the first question, if you don't mind. Um, you sure. have experience in other industries. Um, what can we, can you speak more elaborate and more what we can learn from those other industries so we're literally not reinventing the wheel for our industry? Yeah, I mean, um, if we go back to something like the the automotive industry, um, the I guess the key principle of designing in an environment like that, like a high volume manufacturing environment, is that it all it all starts with a hierarchy of requirements and the, um, the requirements define everything that will happen to that product in its life from the very start of manufacture through to end use by the customer through to its end of life. And you've already got captured in every way how you want that component to behave um, or that, that system. Um, and it's, 
it sounds kind of complex, but it, it, it's defining system behavior and then breaking it down into subsystems, into manageable chunks, each of which has its own set of requirements where you know that when you finally bring that down to its lowest level, you've got a component that has a set of uh, requirements that if you tick those boxes and build it back up into subsystems, you'll end up with an overall building system that is guaranteed to um, fit first time, to meet its cost targets uh, and um, to satisfy the, the end user. Um, but it's something you can't do at the end you have to plan that stuff at the beginning and it has to be um, inherent in everything that you do from that point forward. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Um, here's a question from Lech Mashinsky. Uh, could you elaborate on your research in the assembly metrics? Yeah, sure. Um, So, uh, so some examples that we're showing in the in the photos here. For example, we would set up um, a simulated either a factory environment, which is the the top slide where we're installing some components, and we would uh, we would have technicians who are wearing the equipment that they would be in the factory with the components in the uh, representative position. We'd then install them. Um, measure the times that it takes, maybe compare some different alternatives uh, and calculate what the cycle times would be for the installation of those components. We can then take that to more of a simulated site environment, which is what we're doing on the second slide, um, where we're looking at uh, installation of components in a simulated building bay. Um, but similar sort of thing, measuring um, times and also efforts. So um, we can uh, take those components and, and set them up on uh, on top of a, a load cell, for example, and we can measure how much force it takes to insert a particular fastener. And then cumulatively, you can get a measure of what the operator fatigue is during the course of a, a typical working day. But it's it's surprising how useful this kind of information can be, because you can then um, combine that into predicted assembly times um, for uh, a particular, uh, for, a, for a bay of a building. And very quickly you start to see what aligns. So whether your lift times for a, a component matches the cycle time for installation and whether you're going to have uh, where, basically where the critical path is in assembly. Um, so you know whether you're making the most efficient use of your site crane, for example, which is typically the most expensive asset that you have on your building site. Thank you. And then here's a, I don't know if it's a comment or a question from Lech Mazinski. It said, your ideal partners for investigating daring out of the box solutions uh, and learning are academic labs, as long as there is funding. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, and I guess, uh, uh, academic labs do tend to work on an academic sort of um, annual cycle as well. Everything tends to be kind of project based. So it has a, um, th there's a sort of natural timing that's associated with that. Um, I guess there's a, there's pros and cons to commercial and academic labs for sure. Um, and both have their place. And, uh... I have another question as well. I mean, New Zealand is a, you know an island nation, relatively small population, but I'm reading more about the mass timber industry growing there. But are, are many of the people and companies involved actually quite international like you? Very much so. I mean, I guess we have to be, you know, we're a, we're a country of uh, 5 million people. So the domestic market is not that big. Um, and in order to be a uh, sort of thriving engineering company, you have to look outside our, our own borders. Um, but in some ways, I think being down here and isolated, it, it, has, its, um, it has its pros and cons. Um, we have to try extra hard to get materials here and so on. Um, but that can be managed, that can be done. But also being down here, maybe 
uh, lets us think a little bit differently because we're outside of the normal conventional way of doing things. Um, I think there's a bit of a, a New Zealand tradition of uh, not necessarily doing things the conventional way uh, and being prepared to, to try different solutions. Yeah, and I, I want to ask you the same question I asked Mike Gelhoff when he was speaking on the mass timber industry in British Columbia. Um, to move New Zealand, which I think has pretty abundant forest resources, away from being a competitive low-cost exporter of commodity logs, yeah. what advice would you advise if you could? You had you know unlimited funding or a lot of power to the to the, the government of New Zealand to so create jobs, do more value-added products and services of Absolutely. the wood industry. So you're exporting higher value-added products, even kit of parts or even homes. Yeah, what? absolutely that. And it is so, it is starting to happen. Um, so there's uh, there's an interesting company here called Unilog, um, TTT Products, who make a hollow cord log, which can be used as part of a, um, like a foundation raft for stabilizing ground for uh, seismic areas. And they, uh, their sort of mission is to create uh, a high value export um, commodity. Uh, and that, that kind of thing is definitely the direction that we should be going using kind of innovative technology like that. They have their hollow core technology, for example, but using innovative technology that's not readily available elsewhere to create a demand for export. So, I mean, currently we, um, this isn't my, my specialist area by any means, but uh, I understand that a, a big part of the export um, demand for the radiata pine from New Zealand is its ability to be um, modified with treatments. There's, there's, uh, because of the nature of the, um, the structure of the timber, it's particularly receptive to uh, certain kinds of treatments like um, Akoya and Kebony and that sort of thing. Um, I see no reason why those sorts of processes couldn't be happening here in New Zealand and exported in their treated form. Um, so I think there's plenty of opportunity there. Okay, and I get another question from me. How do people keep track of what's happening at Home Solutions with John Roebuck and New Zealand? <laughs> Absolutely, well, <laughs> one of the problems we have is uh, because of the nature of the clients we work with and the sort of work that we do, most of what we do is actually quite secret. So most of the products that we've developed are covered by some sort of NDA. So it, it's quite likely that um, people are already using and familiar with things we've worked on. They just don't know it and we just can't talk about it. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, so we have uh, our, our website, homesolutions.com. Um, and yeah, we're always interested in um, hearing from people and hearing what's going on out there in the industry. And um, we're certainly, yeah, th this being involved with this event has been a, a great experience for us. Uh, and we definitely want to say, can, stay connected with this community. And um, yeah, it will be, uh, it'll be really interesting to see where this takes us. Well, beautiful. Thank, thank you for your time. And I'll try to get this uh, video up on the website uh, later this week and uh, look forward to connecting more and also at the Mass Timber Conference. Thank you Excellent. for your time. Thank you, audience. Thanks, Greg.